Mm. And yes, death and the realms of existence. Um, this is a reminder to myself. I hope I can keep it in mind throughout tonight's class, uh, but I'll offer it to all of you as well to, especially with this class, just try to catch what your mind is doing as you encounter these concepts. Um, and please don't let it be just learning about some hypothetical or imaginative alternate reality. And it can sound like that sometimes. I mean, right, tonight we're gonna to talk about the hell realms. And sometimes it's easier to think of it as a hypothetical alternate reality than, than an actual truth for some people, for some beings. Um, but I'll just ask that, yeah, stay open with that part of your mind that is curious and almost childlike at the possibility of this uh, being possible. And then why, asking yourself why constantly, why are you engaging with these ideas? Let at least some flavor of that be to gain an understanding of your world as it appears to you now, right? If you can, if you can unlock the thing that causes a hell realm, that's not that different from unlocking the thing that's causing your current experience right now. Um, and there's power in that. If you can do that for yourself, uh, you could show someone else that doorway. And it, it becomes, it, it, there's a lot of power in that. Um, I'm getting a little feedback, but that's my short preamble. We'll get more into it. I just wanted to, yeah, death in the realms of existence, fancy title, but really what we're doing is exploring where does our experience of the world come from? And David, your question, is it this line? The one that begins with Edom? Okay, great. So it's Edom, Guru Ratna, Mandala Kam, Niryatayami. And I guess I usually do it pretty fast. I can slow it down. But I think I do the rhythm like Edom, Guru Ratna, Mandala Kam, Niryatayami. But it's that. And I don't know if that line seems to not have a translation. I can, I mean, guru is guru, teacher. I want to say ratna is jewel. It is at least in Hindi. I would think mandala come has something to do with mandala, which we learned last week about what that means. Niryatayami, I have no idea what that means. So for those who are new, this is a little offering that we give at the start of class. Uh, let it be weird and different if it feels that way for you. The idea is to interrupt normal. Interrupt whatever story your mind was on today, whatever personality your mind had today, that voice, just let this be a little interruption in that. And what we're doing, this is a little mini review actually of last week, we're gonna go into more detail. But you are, Mm, okay, I don't know if people knew this. Yes, know this. Um, yesterday was the 51st anniversary of humans landing on the moon, like the Apollo 11 mission, uh, which I think is amazing. Like 51 years is not that long. I think that's how old my mom is. Uh, it's not that long ago that we sort of got that vantage point of this planet that we call Earth. So what we're doing in this little offering is, or what I like to do is almost imagine I was there on that vantage point of being on the moon or being somewhere in the universe, looking back on this planet, on this home that we have. And you're trying to hold that view in your mind, like visualize it in your mind, and then actually see it transform. So see all of the pain, all the separation, all the suffering, the people, the climate, whatever it is that pulls at your heartstrings, see that transform completely into a paradise. Whatever that means to you, all problems gone, all minds free. And that sort of visual, that um, paradise that you've created, you then give it away like a spiritual bribe. So you say, okay, mind, I'm gonna stop normal, I'm creating this visual, I'm giving it away. In exchange, please, in these next two hours, let me hear something that will help me, that'll give me that answer that I'm looking for, that'll 
open up some new corner in my mind. Mm. Yeah, that'll interrupt normal in a more permanent way. So it's like a, that's kind of what, that's part of what we're doing with this. So just take, and if you want to just experience it like a meditation, please do that. Um, otherwise you can follow along. You'll see the words here. So just take a comfortable position. You can allow the eyes to fall closed. You're used to this. Let's everyone just take a breath together. Inhale. Exhale, try to let go of anything that's not right now and right this moment. And just begin creating that offering in your mind. Try to sustain it throughout the whole chant. Sashi Puki Jikshing Metok Tram Ram Ling Shin in the Gampadu Sangye Shing Ju Mikte Warki Drokun Namda Ching La Drupar Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kamne Atayami Sangye Chirang Soki Choknam Jangchu Bardu Dakni Kapsuchi Daki Chinyan Gipe Sanam Ki Jola Penchir Sangye Drupar Sangye Chiram Sogi Chaknam Jangchu Bardu Dakni Kapsu Chi Daki Chinyan Gipe Sanam Ki Jola Penchir Sangye Tripar Shuk Sangye Chiram Sogi Chaknam Jangchu Bardu Dakni Kapsu Chi Daki Chinyan Gipe Sanam Ki Jola Penchir Sangye Jupar Okay, so um, before we go into a review of just last class, I'll set the scene a little bit since we have some new, um, new people joining us. So for those of you who've been in the course, just try to move your mind to do this again, situate yourselves within the wheel of life from the Buddhist perspective, right? That's the backdrop for this course. We'll go into specifically a review of last class, which was about the formation of the world uh, through this lens, like from a Buddhist perspective. You could think about it as, I don't know, their version of the Big Bang Theory, uh, but not, um, Sorry, yes, Lynn, no, this is not our last class. This is class seven, but I mean a review of class six. But uh, yeah, so it's like their version of the Big Bang Theory, but observed not necessarily through technology and scientific tools, but using the investigative method of meditation, right? Or contemplation of, uh, that's, that's where these things are coming to us from. So everything I'm presenting in this course is, I, I'm not making anything up. If I'm ever telling my own interpretation or story, I try to make it really clear. But this particular course, we're studying this text called the Abhidharma Kosha, uh, which is this beautiful, one of the great books of Buddhism. Just one chapter within this book, this book has all of the information or more, but it's from that one chapter that this whole course kind of uh, derives. 
And where am I going with this? Okay, so Wheel of Life is our backdrop. So we began this course to kind of, again, remember you're, you're shaking away the normal way we see the world. So just stay with that for this class if you can. Um, and what if, what if you sat with the idea that humans are not the only, or not even just that, these beings that we call humans, right? That, that appear to us as humans, are not the only type of existence in the world. So the Wheel of Life is depicting uh, actually various classes of beings. Humans are just one of them. So there are actually three realms in total, or three realms of suffering, at least, being the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm. I'm going through this quickly, but just to give you a backdrop. Desire realm is where we're squarely situated as humans, which we've had a class on sort of what does it mean to be a human, to have a human mind, to see things through the lens of human. Mm, how is that different from seeing through the lens of animal, another type of desire realm being a hungry ghost or a hell being? That's, what we're, that's who we're focusing on in tonight's class. But basically the idea is this whole course is giving us, it's like, it's like telling us that this whole time we were in the simulation or like in the program and, and didn't know the code. And the point of this or really any Dharma class is to tell you that there is a program or there is a code that's knowable. Mm -hmm. Like you can access it. You can figure out why your specific world is your specific. So we're going to start there and just stay with me with that. I think it's pretty hard to argue all 24 of us on this call right now have 24 different experiences of reality. We're having 24 different quarantines. We're having 24 different Tuesday evenings or experiences of what it's like to be in a body. They're similar. Like there's similarities that's shared. So that's why we can call each other humans and have this collective experience. But really no one knows it through the, the lens, the perception through which you know it. And so the premise of this whole course is that is one, mm, that's one slice of reality, right? It's not denying that that's real. I'm just saying that's one slice of reality. And just as real as that is, some other type of existence is possible. And if we like fast forward, fast forward, fast forward, the crux of it all is an existence is possible that's actually outside of that wheel of life. Mm, outside of it in a way, give me a second, I'm just gonna mute so we get. Outside of it in a way of not like escaping it, you know, there's no like escape door out of the wheel of life that you can just like take that exit and you're out. Uh, it's more understanding what brings it into being in the first place so you can remove that cause. So you make suffering impossible. You eradicate it completely. And you're in the, the fourth and final realm, or you, you, if you even want to call it that, of enlightenment. Which again, fancy word, but uh, who was saying, who was it, Nicolette? Nicolette, maybe it was you about, because so many of, yes, so many of the ideas in ACI are so complicated and so, um, there's so many lists and all, and I like, I hope to think of enlightenment as, it, it's actually very simple. It's beyond all of that. One of the simplest ways to conceive of it is, it's the thing we all want. Uh, it, it's to be happy and to know how we got there. It's to be free completely. It's to be in love with everything. And so steeped in that state that you're actually able to, to give it to other people. Like you could really make someone else happy. You could really free someone else. You could really love someone else. Um, that's not the formal definition of enlightenment, but sometimes I think we get lost in the definitions and things. So try to connect with that feeling. That's a very fast review of where we're at, but basically so far in this course, we've gone through 
thinking about what would the world feel like through the eyes of different types of beings? What would it really be like to have the mind of an animal that's in fear constantly, um, or the mind of a craving spirit? Yeah, and we'll get into it more, but the idea is that the eyes or the mind through which you perceive your world is actually the thing that creates your world. So there's a lot of, uh, it's, very, it's very precious to get to understand that, right? I'll pause there. I'll split us up into four groups. And maybe we'll just do 10 minutes in those groups. So this is the way it's going to work. The group number that you're in is the review question that you have. And this all pertains to last week. I think the way it'll work is someone in your group will have been here the last class and can sort of take lead on the discussion, but just chime in. And I added a fourth question. So this fourth one with the star is me. Um, what are we visualizing when offering a mandala? Why? I sort of gave it away because I talked about it in the beginning, but I also want to know your, hmm, how it landed for you. So that is that. Are the other questions clear? I hope they are. Four different types of sustenance. We talked about that. What is the function of these types of sustenance? And then describe the very first stage in the formation of the world. And if you know or remember any of the other details we talked about, the mountains, the oceans, um, as well as the why behind all of that, you can bring that in. Okay, breakout rooms. And then please know when we come back together, I will ask someone from each room to share. And don't feel like you need to share the right answer, just share what you arrived at. Share the, um, the debate or the questioning that happened in your, in your group. Share something that you think will benefit the rest of class. Uh, so there's no pressure there. Okay. See you all soon. See you in like 10-ish minutes. Any questions before we split? Speak now. All right. Boom.
All right, are we back? Oh no, I think we're just five more seconds. Okay. And I didn't say any, I hope everyone like introduced themselves and got to know each other as well. I assume that happened. Um, okay, and for those of you joining, we are in review mode, reviewing class six, which was the types of sustenance and the formation and the physical world. So let's start there. What, what are we talking about when we're saying the four different types of sustenance? Anyone who is in group one can chime in, please. So um, I'm the representative for group one. And um, we remembered them as smell, hope, food, and pleasure. That, are those right? We, had a, we took us a little time to remember pleasure. And um, we were kind of, towards the end, we were thinking about like how they can influence one another because I asked if there's any sort of hierarchy or one being more important to the other. And then, yeah, we're kind of thinking about like, if you don't have food, you kind of lose hope versus like, if you have food and all the others, but you don't have any hope, you all, there's also doesn't seem like a point of continuing to exist. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we got. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for jumping right in. Um, I think, okay, you said food, hope, pleasure, and? Smell. And smell, okay. So, ish, I think th that definitely covers some of them. I'd say um, the, the formal list that we went over in terms of the four types, food and smells actually are both encompassed into number one, right, called portion sustenance. The idea being something that you could split up into portions in order to consume. So like you split food up into bites, you split smells up into sniffs, right? We talked about bardo beings or those in-between beings as being smell eaters, right? So that would be that type of sustenance. Um, I remember, it, and then if we wanna go into more detail, remember last week we talked about like, there's the subtle and the gross level, which one way to think about that would be like sustenance that causes uh, waste versus not, right? Like physical, you know, waste after eating it, for example, food would be that versus something like um, smells, I'd imagine. So that one, yes, cool. Um, then you had hope, which yes, that was an example of like a movement of mind, right? So like when you can be sustained just by something mental like hope. And yes, I think it's related to uh, food. So that's cool that you guys were sort of thinking about it that way. I'd say that there were two more, which I'm not sure if your list got to. Oh, well, you said pleasure, which yes, has to do with, so we talked about it as, okay, number one, portion sustenance. Number two, contact, right? Which this contact was between an object that we think of as pleasurable, our mind, and some sort of sense perception. So for example, like, after teaching last week, I went down and my sister had made blueberry scones. But I, I sort of knew that she was making them because I could smell them during class, right? So there was the contact between my sense of smell, that sense consciousness, uh, the pleasurable object itself, the blueberry scone, and my mind. So number two, that form of sustenance is actually the contact of those three things. So we have portion sustenance, we have contact sustenance, then the mind, movement of mind sustenance, which would be like hope. And then the last one we talked about was just consciousness itself, right? The thing that sustains from life to life, which I know is a big leap. I'm saying it this way because, you know, we're on class seven in this course. Um, I don't expect everyone to subscribe to the, the idea that, past and future lives exist. But the way it's presented here is that, yes, there is something that dies at the moment of death, right? There is some sort of physical shedding that happens, but uh, 
energy or matter is what is it energy is neither created nor destroyed like something there's also some sort of transformation that goes on at that time it's not just an, it's not just a seen end you know a complete obliteration of everything and in this system the thing that continues on is consciousness or a stream of mind that thing is indestructible so that thing that sustains that's the fourth type of sustenance cool so then, and this is related, group two, could someone chime in with what's the function of those four types of sustenance? It's not a trick question. We were, we essentially they keep us tied to our body and keep us like in samsara. Cool. They keep us in suffering. I feel like we have to unpack more why, but yes. I don't know. Mackenzie had a better handle on it than I did. She doesn't mind talking. I was hoping you would take it and tell us about the monk. <laughs> I'll t I can tell that after you answer the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my idea is that we kind of become addicted to these uh, sustenances and we, we see them self-existently as like, these are the things that are keeping us alive. And that's what keeps us here in the cycle of samsara. Um, not re like, I guess food is a really easy example. It's like, I need to eat to stay alive. Um, but if we actually think about karma and emptiness, like feeding someone else would be the same as feeding ourself. Uh, so it's just interesting to play with that concept to see how these sustenances keep us here in samsara. Um, but yeah, I, I think that our attachment to seeing these things as keeping us alive, keeps us here in this suffering life. That was beautiful. And yeah, so precise. I hope everyone heard that and, and heard the wisdom behind it. I feel like at least myself, I got really intellectual with this stuff last class. Cause it was like, that's my MO usually. So I'm always trying to deconstruct that. Um, and it's great that you gave the example of food, Mackenzie, because that's what came up for me, like very much the experience of ending class, going downstairs and having a blueberry scone that my sister made. Everything clicked for, for me where I was like, oh, this is the sustenance we're talking about. And it's not that the blueberry scone itself is causing samsara, right? Cause of suffering is not blueberry scones. But to Mackenzie's point, it's some, it's some, addiction we have to the way we interact with the blueberry scone, with the way the blueberry scone appears. And she hit it on the head when she said it, it's our addiction to seeing it as self-existent. What does that mean? Especially if you've, if you've heard that before and you're used to just saying that, oh, things aren't self-existent. Stop and ask yourself, what does it mean when you're saying that? If, during every single millisecond that I interacted with that scone, from smelling it, they smelled amazing, to touching it, feeling the heat, to buttering it, to putting it in my mouth and enjoying it. If every single millisecond of that experience, I thought that any of the deliciousness, any of the warmth of the camaraderie, my whole family was around together eating the blueberry scones. It was a beautiful, idyllic moment. If I thought any of that pleasure was coming from the blueberry scones themselves, right? The source of any of that goodness, if I really thought that it was the blueberry scone, which I have to admit a part of my mind did, right? Like it's just natural. That's what we do here. That in that lies the mistake. In that lies the addiction, the habit that we're trying to break. 
Because if I think that, if I really think that the way to get blueberry scones is to rush down and grab the, grab the, the one that's like really crumbly on the outside, but soft on the inside, because that's the best kind and keep it for myself and make sure, you know, I, I have one packed away for tomorrow morning with chai. Like if I really think that's where the experience of scones are coming from, I'm going to get it wrong. I'm getting it wrong. There's just no way. And here's the proof. Uh, there's so many proofs, but here's a simple one. My aunt who lives with us for some reason hates blueberries. Like she was not part partaking in this whole experience. For her, blueberry scones are terrible. She was not about it. There's no goodness coming from the blueberry scone, right? Or imagine if you're allergic to blueberry scones, or probably some of you are like, why is she saying blueberry scones so many times? But the idea being, I, it's really not, if I even think about it for a second, that goodness could not come from the object I'm calling blueberry scone. If you ask yourself that enough, the, the idea isn't to stop there. Okay, well then so what? It was a good blueberry scone. I had a great time. Where did it come from then? Where did that deliciousness come from? It did nourish me. So Mackenzie was saying karma and emptiness, right? The fact that the scones are empty is saying the deliciousness was not an ingredient inside the scone. They're empty of that deliciousness. The karma aspect of it is saying, but there was deliciousness there. I did eat it and I did enjoy it. Why? I did. Mm, there was something in my mind that caused me to experience the scone that way. Right, a little fly, which also ate the scone a few hours later, maybe when we left it on the counter, it didn't experience it in that same way. So the karma is in our mind, and I know karma is a loaded word, we're gonna use it tonight as well. Karma is just the dance of the mind. It's the movement of the mind. That mind being that thing, remember that sustenance type four, that unending noodle of consciousness. No beginning, no end. No one has a mind mm, like yours, like your mind is yours. What you put in it is up to you. And it's a, it sets in motion this chain of cause and effect, cause and result that creates our world. And unexamined, uninvestigated, those addictions just keep ruling us. If I were to just gobble up those scones and not think about for a moment, where did that experience of good scone come from? It must have been a karma ripening in my mind. It must have been from a time I fed others, which I do that a lot. So I'm not surprised I, did, I enjoyed those scones. Like, but if, unless I had made that connection, if I just, in, if I just mm, consumed that scone, I'm just wearing out scone karma right there. So of course that experience is going to come to an end and I have no idea how to recreate it. Because it doesn't come from asking my sister to bake them again. That's not where scones are coming from, according to this model. I hope I didn't lose anyone there, but I feel like for a lot of us that have been in this class, or if you've heard Dharma before, you've heard those terms that things aren't self-existent, that our karma is creating everything. And I beg that you don't just let them become words, because they can really ask yourself and i start with blueberry scones because if you can convince yourself not even convince yourself it's if you can prove to yourself logically that it applies to blueberry scones then you can start to get to the bigger stuff does it also apply to your relationship yeah does it apply to your experience of this body the experience of the community that you're in and the world that you're living in everything Otherwise, empty of a nature, lacking some sort of nature in itself, but real, like so real. The suffering is real. The pleasure is real. You're just asking yourself, where does it come from? What's my role in it? How am I not only connected to it, but interconnected, right? It's interdependent upon what? My mind. The things I put in my mind, namely, the way I treat others. I feed others, I have an experience of scones. It's really as simple as that. 
I'm looking at the chat to see if. Am I present? Am I pronouncing scone incorrectly, Maya? You can unmute yourself. So yes, to someone's point, the pronunciation of scone is empty of a nature. Scone. Is it scone? Oh, that's what she wrote. Yeah, that's how the British pronounce it. Oh, that I should have, I wish you had told me earlier. But having a wife who owns a bakery, sorry, Maya, it's, it's America. We mispronounce some of your words. <laughs> scone is correct in America. In the, in the United States, scone is the correct pronunciation. We say scone. I like that more. It's exactly that, actually. It's like that, you know, um, that tendency we have of like, this is how we do it. This is how it is. Uh, you've got it wrong, right? That's the thing that keeps scone just scone and not a vehicle of nectar, of immortality. Really, no, I'm serious. Like that, that, it's that, it's us. We inject reality into things by thinking we know the way things are. And that's, I think, the part of the magic of this course is it lets you kind of like shake it up inside a little there and be like, just, just take a step back for a second. And how much of your world is just what you were taught to see it as? Or what, or the habit you have of seeing things that way? Um, how often do you get to just pause and be like, what is this thing really? Yeah, it's like, I'm going to jump in again because it actually really is a great, um, it's a great way for me to help understand how we label things and how emptiness is essentially the label we put on it. You know, when the pen example comes up and it, it strikes me as odd that it's a pen. And yet, so many of the people in every Dharma class I ever take, we have people who don't have English as a first language. So when they walk into a room, it is not a pen. They're even labeling it differently than way, the way you're describing pen. And so when you say blueberry scone, all of a sudden, it's messing with the people who pronounce it scone. So I was just joking before. I'm not this, you know, crazy American who thinks we do everything right. But our scones are amazing. So if you're ever in Maplewood, New Jersey, get a good scone. All right, that's it. My commercial plug is over. Bye. No, it's just, it made me, real, one of the many things I've missed about Dharma IRL is that usually Thomas brings treats. We don't have those anymore. But yeah, totally. You just gave me a flashback to New York subway and I loved hearing different languages. Like I, so many more than I thought I would every day. And I remember just like being struck by what just sounded like random decibels to me. I was like, oh, people are having a full on conversation. Like they can understand each other. They are completely clearly communicating. So an example there of how, how words or language or sound is empty of a nature. Does it have meaning from its own side? Does it have meaning? Yes, you all can hear me right now, I hope. Things are happening, things are registering for you. But where is that coming from? It's coming from the wellspring of your own mind. It's every, the ground, it, like everything that's coming out of me right now, it's uh, an offering, it's a little vehicle and it hits the ground of your mind and attains meaning. That's how everything is, is what we're saying. And I just want to make, sh I, I want to have that relationship be really clear because otherwise this class on hell beings um, is going to be like terrifying at best, but like meaningless at worst, you know? <laughs> Uh, and I want it to be more than that. So just keep that in mind and, and ask questions as we go on if you're like, what is this karma and emptiness thing? But here, I'll, I'll say it once more, simple as possible. 
things lack a nature from their own side. Things are not as they seem, but they are real. The thing that makes them real is the potentials in your own mind. That's fancy. Mm. It's the, it's, the inevitable result of everything you've ever thought, said, or done towards yourself or others. All those little mini moments were captured in your mind stream, noticed or not, and they, and they have a result. That result is what we call the experience of our world, right now and right now and right now. That process, uh, that's what we're talking about here. It's a very different way of looking at the world. It opens everything up, including enlightenment. Um, yes. I wanted to just quickly share that uh, just this last conversation around karma and emptiness with respect to the word spelled C-S-C-O-N-E-S opened up, um, opened up like a channel for me to like further understand this concept of emptiness because I was noticing a part of me like ready to get like walked up at uh, the uh, imposition of the American way of pronouncing that word. Like I was like noticing that part of me like, yes, like now is my time to get like walked up and triggered around it. Um, and in that moment, I realized like, I don't even know if how many of the Americans on this chat thread like truly fully believe that American English is like hierarchically, hierarchically above Indian English. And I just like, in that moment, I realized that most of my, that part of me, which was getting worked up, most of it was rooted in like mental groups that I've created for myself over time. Um, yeah, it was just a sudden moment of like that, those words you said, like the fountain of your mental wellspring or something like that. Uh, got a little very, very alive for me uh, in this conversation. Well, I'm so glad I was thinking, I really was thinking of all of you when I was having those blueberry scones, because I was like, ah, oh, this was what we were just talking. This is the sustenance. This is that it, it really brought it. It was a reminder for me. Um, so I, I'm happy to get to share it. I feel like so much goes on just from class to class. I don't know the rate of reality right now. Like there's so many things happening. Um, that was one of the little nuggets I held on to where I was like, I hope this, I hope this helps. Supriya, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, I'm new to these ideas, like very new. And um, I struggle with the idea of um, something coming into being because of my projection or my experience on it. What about another person who is already themselves or another another being? Yeah. Maybe there's something else I can read and not take up time here, but. No, it, it's, it's a beautiful, perfect question. Um, let's use, if you're okay with this, just us right now as an example, right? Here, here I am, another being, Supriya, who you are encountering, right? Aurora, is that your name? Yes. Okay, cool. So you are encountering me, right? Uh, let's say Aurora encountering Supriya. All the, this question, the karma and empties is really, it's a question you get to ask yourself. So the way you could work with it is ask yourself, is your experience of this thing called Supriya the same as mm, my friend Mackenzie, who I've known for a few years, right? She's looking at her, the same little screen on her screen, seems she sees the same color and shapes, but is her experience of square with words Supriya, can it at all be the same as yours? Um, well, more context, like lots more context from Mackenzie, more interactions with you. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, oh yeah, I guess I don't, I don't know if she hears your voice the same way or maybe like knows that the, that's your favorite shirt or 
Yeah. And it's really as simple as that is what we're saying. We're not saying you both aren't having an experience of me, but that experience, if, if it was true that Supriya resided within this thing, right? And, it, and I was this being that was just emanating Supriya-ness, right? If we, and, and we do think that, right? That's why we like spend all this time on our personalities and such. But if that were true, then any being, all 27 of you, plus anyone who catches a glimpse of me from my window should see me that way. If inherently I possessed that essence, that Supriya ness. Right. And that's all, we're, all I'm saying when I'm saying I'm empty of a nature is I'm saying that Supriya ness doesn't exist that way. You are having a perception of me, but it, it has everything, it has, yeah, it has everything to do with your mind. Right. Yeah. So then, and so it absolutely does apply to other people as well. That helps. Cool. I'm glad. Thank you. Can I share just like a, a little anecdote that really helped me when I was first learning this idea, which was, um, around like I feel like everyone's had a boss that they just like really don't get along with and it's and I think it was maybe Hector who gave this some like an enlightenment club or something but that boss like has a family has has kids and a wife maybe or a husband whatever a partner who like really loves them so like if inherently this boss was like shitty person like I this person like makes my blood boil I like hate them so much if that was inherently like in them, then everyone in their life would see them that way too. So there's something in me that, that is creating this idea that this specific creature in this body is shitty person. Um, and it, for some reason, just like working with someone I really didn't like helped a lot. So <laughs> I figured I would throw that out there rather than just like, well, I don't know. She seems nice, but like the per like there's a reason that you know you you loathe someone and somebody else absolutely adores them. So, yeah, yeah. If you've ever had an experience of like a lover who became a foe or a BFF that turned into like a mortal enemy, there's proof right there. How could they be both of those things at the same time? Okay, so maybe we'll let, I, we're good on time, I think. I just want to quickly describe the very first stage in the formation of the world. Who took this on? Okay, I was selected to give the answer, and I'm having a big craving for blueberry scones right now. That's going to be my project for tomorrow to look for some. But anyway, okay. Um, first, there was a gentle wind, and it spun around itself. And then it started going faster and faster and stronger and stronger for a really long period of time for eons. And then it formed a disc. And the one thing that we were confused about when we were talking about this, when they said the formation of the world, do they literally mean our planet or are they talking about the entire universe? Yeah. Yep. So I believe that, perspective, the Abhidharma perspective of the world forming from a swirling disk of wind, the corollary would be our planet, like planet Earth. Um, and the reading goes into more detail and they say it's the world created with the OG Buddha, like Shakyamuni, Shakyamuni Buddha's paradise. So the world that somehow is connected to that paradise, that's the formation. That's the world they're talking about. So how did the rest of the universe form according to them? I don't know. It's, maybe it's in some other part of the Abhidharma. It's not given, as far as I know, in um, class six. Okay. But could you say, so like they do acknowledge that there is a universe. They say there's infinite numbers of planets, infinite numbers of beings on them. They don't go into detail as to how they were formed. Ultimately, yes, they're all formed by karmic projections, but we're in the Abhidharma school right now, which is, uh, there is a belief of some sort of external reality. 
we'll leave it at that. Okay, and then this little bonus question. Mm, I'm just curious because I think everyone holds this in a different way, but I was, does, would anyone like to share there? I wonder what group four was talking about. Now that we've sort of unpacked what the word mandala actually means, right? Mandala is literally that disc that Suzanne was just talking about, that swirling um, disc of like gold and water, I think, right? And then it ends with like a, a diamond hard surface that is at the root of the formation of the world. So what are we visualizing when offering a mandala and why? And then we'll get into the next class. You can share from our group. Um, so in visualizing the mandala, we are envisioning this perfect world, like the most ultimate bliss, um, not just for ourselves, but for all beings. So um, yeah, we went into a, a deep discussion about that, but um, it is, it's like the ultimate, if you could imagine the realm of like no suffering, everyone's just like walking around in this ultimate bliss, that would be what we're envisioning with the offering. Beautiful. Yeah, I just wanted to get, because it took me a while to get here. It's just sort of that, the difference between escapism versus alchemy. And mandala offering is more alchemy, less escapism. It's not saying reject this world, right? This world is broken, this world is suffering. I'm gonna go somewhere else. That's not serving anyone. It's more saying, how did this world get to be the way it is? What role do I have to play in that? Conscious or, or unconscious? Uh, and therefore, if you can get to the view of karma and emptiness, there's nothing you're not responsible for. There's no problem that you're not responsible for. There's also no mm, bliss that you're not responsible for. So then you, then you feel this fervor to take care of your world, right? To actually see it as that little pale blue dot floating in the void of space, fragile, and you, you take care of it. You love every being on it. And so, yes, that's what we get to do in our minds when we offer the mandala. Not escaping the world, transforming it. Okay, I hope that review is helpful. Shall we get into class seven? We'll take your silence as yes. Okay, so this is going to be all about the lives of hell beings. Before we dive in, it's heavy. Um, please ask questions as we go through. And also ask yourself, like, up until this moment, what is your relationship with the word hell? I'm assuming you have one. I mean, I didn't really have one before Dharma class. I sort of grew up Hindu, but mainly, uh, mainly learning about the stories through dance, through Indian classical dance. And I don't think there's, like, a Hindu equivalent of hell. But there wasn't in, in so far that I know. Like, I can't think of a dance that I learned that depicted it. So I very much, whenever I heard hell, I was like, oh, it's a Judeo-Christian concept, like it doesn't pertain to me. I don't subscribe to that belief. Uh, and so I just never really paid attention. And I didn't have that as a thing in my mind. So it was very eye-opening to be presented with hell through the Buddhist perspective. Um, and that's really like my only, the only way I work with it now. But I'm sure many of you have some other relationship to it. Maybe you think of it as like the counterpart to heaven. Or is it hypothetical or not? Uh, perhaps like me as well, you see that it's, that for many people here on planet earth, their lives are a form of hell, compared to mine at least, right? The way that they have, the way that they, it's not even the way that they have to live, but the, the torment in their own minds. Maybe they're always living in fear or, they're always feeling that they're judged or they literally can never have enough. That sort of mental hell. Um, so maybe you see it that way. So just, just catch whatever your mind has right now uh, around that word. And Diego, the pale blue dot. Okay, I'll go over this quickly. I shared this story. You were there at the end of last class. My former professor, astronaut, when he, he's gone in. Okay, Zoe asked this. Okay. 
Well, I'm going to ask that Diego catch you up because he was there and I'm going to keep going. The astronaut was Mike Massimino. He's on Instagram. He's very sweet. Okay. So the hell realms, we're going to go over like the geography of them first, what they look like, the types of beings there. And I promise before class ends, we're going to talk about how it's possible to get there. How does one get to hell? We will get there. Um, okay, so according to Buddhism, there are eight hot hells. There's also eight cold hells. We're going to go over all of them. Uh, here's a little visual for you. There's eight levels, and they go from lightest on the top, like the top slice of the cylinder. It looks to me like cookie dough. Now, everything, I'm looking, everything is through the lens of baked goods now <laughs> to me. But like that first sliver of cookie dough on the top is the lightest one, as in the least amount of hellish torture. And as you go deeper and deeper, it gets worse. So these hell realms are said to reside underneath the earth, like within the earth kind of thing. Uh, below ground in, in some sense, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, so here we go. The first hell, the lightest hell, it's called Revive Again, or Yangsu in Tibetan. I didn't put the Tibetan on the slides, but Yangsu, Revive Again. And I'll give you like kind of a, a little, I'll try to paint a little story of what it's like in each of these hells, okay? So in this first one, the idea is that you appear in this hell realm. So for those of you who remember the types of birth that we studied, a hell being is born complete. You know, you don't have like a hell childhood and a hell adolescence, you're just a hell being. So you come into being born complete. And in this hell, uh, as soon as you pop into existence, everyone else who you see around you, you hate them. Just immediately, everyone around you, you hate them. You're filled with anger and hatred towards them. And you find yourselves with like weapons just in your hands and everyone begins attacking each other. That's just the characteristic of existence there. So you pop into being, you are surrounded by people you find yourself hating and you begin attacking them. They say, they basically just keep at it until you're knocked unconscious in this hell. And then at that time, like I imagine, you know, through an overhead speaker or something, you hear this loud voice say Yangsu, which means revive. So from your unconscious state, you are rendered awake again, and you go through it all over again. So you're rendered awake, you're like, oh, there you all are, the people that I hate. Oh, here's a weapon in my hand, and you go for it. So the very thing that propels you, this hatred, this irritation towards others, and then seeing yourself harming them, karmically com makes complete sense that you find yourself harmed over and over again. You're knocked unconscious. You hear that voice, Yangsu. You revive again, and you're doing it over and over again. So this is the lightest form of hell. Um, the specific type of pain here, they say, is it is that pain of being knocked unconscious or dying repeatedly. So I think we've talked about this before, but uh, in this perspective, there's no such thing as dying peacefully. Like it might appear that someone's passing peacefully, but the experience of your mind being separated from your body um, or your mind being separated from everything you held on to as me, depending on how strong that holding on to was, that last moment is very, very painful. And they say we know how painful it is. It's like that feeling if you were to get close to a cliff and you know when like kids prank each other and you like try to, you know that thing where they like push you but catch you and your body just recoils, right? Like we all, it's that, it's a muscle, it's a reflex almost. And they say that's like the muscle memory of knowing how painful it is to die. Because if it's true, our mind stream has been around since beginningless time, we've all died many times. We've all been in this hell many times. So one of the particular pains of this hell is that you have to go through that feeling again and again and again. Mm. 
we only as humans only have to feel that pain once at the moment of death. So how do you get out? Yeah, so you're gonna find this as, especially as we go deeper and deeper in the house, uh, I'll give you all sorts of forms of like the torture and the pain that happens there. But I think it'll become clear that the main torture is that it's very hard to get out because of the mental agony that you're in, right? You don't have a moment to ask yourself, oh, am I really angry at that person, right? Is that person who's appearing there shitty from their own side, in your words, right? You don't even have a moment to ask yourself that because you're so tormented. And this is, this is the lightest hell. So it's very, very hard to get out, they say. Um, it's just you wearing, you're wearing out your karma at a certain point. Uh, there, it's not impossible to get out of a hell realm, but it's not easy. That's what makes it a hell realm. It's not the, it's not the flames. It's not the, the torture devices. It's actually the inability of your mind to understand what got you there in the first place and thereby try to get out. So yeah, I know this is devastating and it's gonna get worse, so stick with me. Try to let it open up your heart if possible. That's the way I get through it. Okay. Um, also, time passes really slowly in hell. So this is like millions of years in from a human existence would be one existence in revive again. Okay, so this one's not great either. Number two, so we're going a little bit deeper. It's called Black Line. Um, in this one, so in this one, you're never knocked unconscious. That's part of the increased amount of pain. You're just constantly having to endure it. And the way it's described is um, all the hells get hotter as you go down. So heat is gonna be you know, a, a main motif here. But basically what's happening is that these beings, these hell guards, hells are guarded by other hell beings called hell guards, and they take these hot chains um, and like splice them across your body to like create marks, like perforations. And then along those black lines, like those, those burning lines, your body um, disintegrates, right? So like if there's a line, you know, at your shoulder joint, your arm will, will detach from the rest of you. And one of the things that happens is each of those pieces of you can still experience pain. It's not like they, you know, it's not like it goes away. So you're like chopped up. Each of these pieces is experiencing pain and then you find yourself regenerated only for it to happen again over and over. And there's no, there's no break from it. You never get to be knocked unconscious. You always feel pain endlessly your body just regenerates and then you start over again. So that's the second one. This is called tick knock or line black, black line for those burning lines on your body. Third round, third hot hell, going deeper, gather and smash or dun jom, gather and smash. Okay, so what's happening here these hell guards or these, you know, these hell overlords are driving you into these like canyon like spaces in between mountains. Um, and then the walls, as in like the mountain walls collapse and smash you. You have the experience of space collapsing and smashing you. And then they open and you regenerate. Gather and smash. Um, and they say that the mountains themselves, they take the form of animals. Like they start to, the stones look like animals. And that is to represent the animal life that you took, that you killed, that would result in you having to experience this hell. So Sometimes in the hell realms, there's like that clear correlation, right? That karmic correlation. What would I have to do to get to this type of hell? Overall, it's uh, basically causing others pain, right? Enough that you would then be forced to experience pain. 
in an unending way. If you've studied things like the five immediate misdeeds, you know that certain deeds are worse than others, right? Or if you've taken vows, you'd understand that breaking a vow would be worse than just being mean to your sister. Here, they talk about gather and smash this hell realm, the specific cause for it being um, indiscriminately killing animals, perhaps even like with joy. But the idea is that these rocks, these mountains that come and smash you, they start to look like the animals that you killed in your life previously. So I think that's interesting. Um, and then the, I guess the idea is with each, like, so gather and smash and then you regenerate. Each time you regenerate, your, your lifespan gets a little bit longer. That experience of being smashed takes even longer. <clears throat> Does that include hey, eating meat? Sorry, did you say that it's like a slow smashing? It's not just like, a... That's my understanding. And they say here, the lifespan gets longer each time, each after each smash. Um, yeah, Diego, I mean, I'm sure you haven't, this isn't the first time you've thought about eating meat. Uh, there's no, there's no one, there's no one with a clipboard at the, entrance of hell asking you, hey, in your life, did you eat meat or not? Right? There's no karmic scorekeeper outside of your own mind. So I'll ask you, is, if you yourself are eating meat, what's your practice around that? How do you see yourself engaging with that? There's many ways to do it. You could decide to abstain because you see meat or the meat industry, let's say in this country, as taking life. And you're like, okay, I don't want to partake in that. I don't want to put that into my mind stream because I know it will have an effect. That's one way to practice. It's not the only way to. You could absolutely engage in eating meat uh, with an understanding of where it's coming from with a purification practice built into it saying, okay, I know I'm uh, participating in the, uh, in the death of some sort of being but I'm going to make sure each bite is giving me nourishment to serve others. And at the same time, I'm going to purify the uh, experience of eating meat in some other way. I'm going to care for life in some other way. The fourth step, you know, you know how to purify. So I'm not, there's no right or wrong answer here. The idea isn't that if you're a pure vegetarian, you would never make it to gather and smash hell. It has everything to do with your awareness around that act of eating meat. Because meat is not meat from its own side. It's empty of a nature. Great. Okay. Number four, we're halfway through <clears throat> the hot house. So number four is called scream or new, new, new mabu. I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Um, screaming hell. So, okay, in this one, you appear and the ground is made of Iron, like red hot iron, everywhere. But as far as you can see, the, that's what the ground is made out of. Um, also, you're naked and you have nowhere to go. But obviously you're in pain, so you just find yourself running around. You can't stand still and your flesh is burnt on this searing hot iron ground. So it gets to the bone and then the bone burns up. And so basically they say your whole body like just starts to burn as you crawl around then on this iron ground. And as soon as the body burns up, it then regenerates and you do it all over again. So it's titled so because all you can hear are the screams of those in this realm running around. Supriya, so, yep. that's like, that's like one of my favorite, well, I shouldn't say that because this is depressing as hell, but um, one of my favorite movies, uh -huh. oh, what's the name of it? <laughs> Tip of my tongue, but it has Robin Williams in it. What dreams may come? And yes. he has to go, does everyone know that movie? Yes. Okay, and he has to climb over the sea of all of these heads of people screaming and moaning wow. in a hell realm wow. to try and look for his wife. Because that movie's beautiful because it shows you, like, 
you know, put them into what all around can kind of look like. We don't really have physical concepts of what that would look like in our head, but that would be definitely good. Anyway, that's my aside, okay? Yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's like if anyone's read Dante's Inferno, it's kind of uh, uncanny how similar the descriptions are of these levels of hell. Um, I also, I mean, and I couldn't help but think of it as I was preparing for this class. One of the, one of the clearest proofs for me that a hell is possible is because I do see lighter versions of all of these in our world right now. Like continents are burning right now. People's existence can feel like gathering and smashing right now. Maybe not to that extreme, exaggerated degree, but in compared to how I live my life, absolutely. Like that could be ab absolutely the state of mind that someone has. So then, if karma and so if the laws of karma, which we haven't gone into detail in this class, but one of the the first one being that karma expands, it doubles every twenty four hours. So of course, it it just doesn't seem. Um, impossible to me that that some, some something like this could really be someone's existence it's not that out there according to this system so that's screaming and then there's great screaming which is they say the same as above but worse what makes it worse the same as above everything just hurts more than the one above yeah So getting worse as we go down, number six. Oh, you do it. Yes. What? Oh. Um, yeah, I wanted to. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I wanted to just stay again with this idea of um, let's just use the example of the animals and the the smashing becoming animals if you've killed animals and you saying that it's depend somewhat dependent upon one's one's intention how one treats a thing because that's what creates the grooves in the consciousness and this is an example that brings up for me a question that comes into my mind a lot which is around the consciousness of people who don't even perceive meat as animals so and in general the consciousness around like this idea that ignorance is bliss almost feels like it's being proven <laughs> by these buddhist thoughts like if your intention is if you're walking around with like love as best you know it and you just it just never occurred to you that animals could be you know, something worth not eating. It just was part of what you were raised in and it's just, you know, it hasn't caused you to question it. And it's actually in a way luck that allows us all the privilege to get to question our own choices and like grow that like, or what I should say is being able to grow is often like a, a privilege, you know? So there are many, many people who would not think about would not think about meat, would not see meat. And I asked a similar question around like, what if you don't see sexism? But like, if you really don't, and your intention that's living inside your, the deepest part of you that is aware is loving. It's just that you haven't opened up deeper channels of awareness yet. Like, how does that correspond to where you end up based on the grooves you've created in your mind. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's so much there. A couple thoughts I have, and everyone else, please chime in or, or contemplate that question and uh -huh. chat. Uh, but a couple things as you were speaking, Marissa, Yes, the intention has everything to do with it. 90% of a karmic seed is intention. Mm. Uh, however, if you plant delusion or plant within the field of delusion, you will receive delusion, regardless of how well-intentioned you think you are. Mm. 
that's one side of it. I liked how you brought up the word loving awareness uh, because there's this there's this uh, inextricable link between love and wisdom in Mahayana Buddhism, right? As in, they say that the more you can actually love others, or here, let me start with the more wisdom you have, wisdom being a code for the more you can see things as empty of a nature, the more naturally you will start to love the world. If you can really see the world as empty and you as, the cre as a creator in the, of that experience, you will naturally come to love more than before. And then the reverse is also true. The more you find yourself loving others, naturally wisdom begins to dawn in your mind. It becomes easier to hold this intellectual thing we call, that we're, we're working with right now called emptiness. So wisdom and love are totally inextricable in that way and they take you deeper into the truth. So I liked what you said there because I feel like truly if you were cultivating love, you, you wouldn't be able to delude yourself at a certain point. And then if you were truly working with that anti-delusion, you would have nothing but love. So that's one thing that came up. And then the other thing which you know, I, I, I'm always also challenging myself with is anytime I start thinking about somebody else's karma, Mm. I've already got it wrong. Like anytime I'm like, well, what about their karma over there? What will happen to them if they do that? Uh, I have to remember that they, that they and their karma is ultimately also me and a projection from my own mind. The way I see them is the way I'm forced to see them. It's actually a reflection of something within me. Mm. The Buddha in disguise. So that's this game. There's nothing out there that's not coming from you because if that were the case, it couldn't be performed. If that were the case, what? If that were the case, if even 1% of the world existed at inherently, then that 1% couldn't be transformed into enlightenment. We're talking 100% enlightenment, 100% eradication of suffering. So if there's any part of the world that has some self-existence to it, even 1% self-existence, then how is that part transformable? What, what's hap what's going to happen to that part if you go to paradise? How is that possible? You work with that kind of dissonance. Okay. Yeah. So, Priya, you said to chime in. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Marissa. No, no. Please, Sarah. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> hey, baby. So just when you were talking, um, you you were saying something like, you know, what if you have these, this good intention in your heart and you just, but you just don't see racism or you just don't see, you know, you just don't question um, that killing could be wrong or, or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. I, my thoughts were, if you have that, perhaps that means you do get exposed to teachings. You know, like you're planting seeds to be exposed to the teachings of Dharma so that you do start to question it and wake up. And you said, like, it's a privilege to wake up or to, to you know, start yeah. to relieve your ignorance. So that's just where my mind went. And I thought I would chime in with that wait, wait, do perspective. You like, do you mean like ig in, in ignorance will, will always lie a seed for receiving for growth like in and of itself no like if your intention is always with love and compassion then you're planting seeds to receive you I may know. be planting seeds to receive teachings so that you can give more love and compassion and receive more loving i see i see uh-huh it's like another way of saying what supriya said around love and wisdom yeah yeah i love that example you gave just now that's interesting it makes me think of why sometimes Dharma class, when we, especially when we start with the first Arya truth of life is suffering, like it's not always butterflies and sunshine. I mean, obviously we're talking about the hot hells, but right, like the lessons you learn, they're not always palatable. But yeah. what you're saying, you're like, yeah, maybe that intention will get you to then face the real, but hard truth of the suffering. Of this That's world. cool. Um, and then that will open up. Mm. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Cool. 
I had a response to this too, um, if I may share. Um, and it's like, it reminds me of like one of my most favorite contemplative exercise in this class so far, which was uh, why does the Buddha choose to talk about these other there's some crazy low sound. Oh, is it maybe our AC? Oh, let Let's me switch off. that off. Okay. No, no, it's our AC. We hardly ever use. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, David. Um, yeah, uh, I was saying that uh, <laughs> uh, it reminded me of my favorite contemplative exercise, which is why does the Buddha choose to even speak about these realms? And the answer that has come to me so far is that, um, and this is a roundabout way of answering the question that Marissa is, but I think this context is useful. Um, the answer is that because the Buddha sees beings of all of these realms pass through the human body at different points of time. So when the Buddha speaks to human beings, in a sense, he's actually communicating with all of the different beings that, let me correct. When I say the Buddha, I mistakenly use the pronoun he, but what I meant is like they, uh, he or she, um, whatever the pronoun is. Um, Right, so when, when the Buddha speaks to beings, they are speaking to all beings and us humans have a very anthropocentric view of everything. So we, and that's where this question even arises of like, why is the Buddha talking about all of these other realms? It's because we, do not recognize that these realms are in us um, and we are attached to our bodies. And the, the human being is that part of the consciousness, unconsciousness, subconscious spectrum that is able to do this kind of work. So when, so back to the question around someone who eats meat but is like fully ignorant of meat being associated with a dead animal that person then has more of one of the pleasure realm, realms as a part of their consciousness which then seeds like like causes this ignorance and thereby would just make it longer for them to uh, get to enlightenment, like more life cycles to get to enlightenment. Because there, the, if you break down all of the different realms passing through their human body container, there is a higher percentage of the pleasure realms, um, like the formless or like the deva realms, which is like, you know, everything is great. Um, I, I, in my head, I'm also equating a pleasure realm as a highly privileged realm uh, where one doesn't have to think about suffering as much. Um, so that was, yeah, I don't know how much of that made sense, but that's kind of what was alive in me in response to that. Yeah, it makes me think of actually um, someone when this class was originally taught asked, you know, where did we get this description from of the hells from? How, how did someone live to recount this? Like, where did we get this from? Uh, and the story that's shared is that a student of the Buddha's, you know, said, I need some motivation to practice. You know, like they're having one of those lazy days, maybe. And they're like, why, why should I do this stuff? Why should I sit and meditate? Why should I love others? Why should I contemplate reality? And like Virgil guiding Dante, the Buddha guided this uh, student through the hells, knowing that 
they couldn't just describe it. They had to see it for themselves that, hey, this alternative is possible. This is what it could be like. And that's where we actually get these descriptions from. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And, and to maybe I heard this, Viggy, in what you were saying. Uh, humans are, there are many millions and trillions more hell beings than there are humans. It is much more rare to become, to have a human existence than within a human existence. It's very, very rare to have access to this thing called Dharma not just as an intellectual exercise, but as a way to live your life. And then within all those people that have access to Dharma, it's even more rare to actually put it into practice and to resolve to get those insights. Um, and then it's even more rare to actually ha have those experiences, to actually have the direct experience of emptiness, to actually progress through the five spiritual paths. So that's something to keep in mind too. Okay, we're gonna go through the last two um, hot hells. So number seven is, we did six, which is Sawa, and then seven is Raptu Sawa, which is extremely hot. Um, or sorry, did we, do, I'm not sure if we did number six. So basically number six is your, it, what it says there, you're roasting inside a metal hut. So I think of it as, you know, like Matilda and that door, that her evil teacher put her in that little chamber. You're locked in this little chamber sealed door everything inside is heated there's no escape and you're just stuck there roasting suffering if you come to an end you regenerate and you find yourself there again so that's sawa rub to sawa extremely hot similar um yet the the yeah the choki that's what it is sam yeah so in in extremely hot you're actually put into a chamber with two rooms and your mind is always telling you that the other room is better. So you're running back and forth from one to another. Um, and your feet and your legs burn up as you run. And each one of them, is, you know, it's, it's equally horrid torture. But it's that hope that, su that sustains you, right? Of thinking that there's something better on the other end. So you're running back and forth. So running back and forth between two torture rooms. And then the last one, the hell that's called no respite. Um, this one it's so it's the worst of the eight hot hells right at the very bottom um in sanskrit this is avici and this is the greatest pain possible so they say even a moment of pain in this hell realm is more than all of the pain put together of all three realms desire form and formless is just one moment in this hell. And the way they describe it is like you appear there and from the east, this jet of fire hits your body. And so immediately you become incandescent and you become like a filament in a light bulb. That's how it's described. So you don't even look like a being anymore. You look like a filament in a light bulb. And the only way someone would know you're there is like a soft extinguishing moan that you, you let out. Um, otherwise, it's just these filaments of these burning beings. <clears throat> That's it. Otherwise, you just think it was a column of flame there. And they say, this is the longest lifespan that exists in this hell of no respite. <clears throat> so yeah, I know that's not easy to get through. Let's do the cold house next. Uh, we won't go into detail in each of them. I'll show you an image after that sort of lays it out, but the cold hells, there's also eight of them. Um, same idea, they get worse as you go from one through eight. Um, and essentially the idea here is you are, again, you appear fully born, naked and cold. Uh, there are these icy winds blowing, and instead of, you know, your body burning up, your body is splitting open from the cold. So it starts with blistering, you know, blistering from the cold, and they say each blister is, like, adorned with frostbite. Uh, then those blisters are bursting and themselves freezing, chattering, the sounds that these beings would make, some moaning and cold, screaming and cold. And then number six, seven, and eight, I know they kind of sound poetic, but they're not. Um, the idea here, the flat, it's like 
yeah, the body begins to split open like a flower. Um, I, it, it was interesting because when I hear flower, I think, so I don't want to do too much of a tangent here, but uh, yoga is a part of the path to enlightenment. It is a part of the Tibetan Buddhist system. And I've always loved the reminder that the chakra system in yoga it's not like beautiful flowers the way often you know diagrams in the west depict it and flowers are it, or the chakras are actually like these knots within our own physical body that are reflections of knots in our own mind stream right it's like these entanglements of every time we get angry or jealous or irritated or just misunderstand and that's what creates our body so i just thought it was when i saw flowers here i thought that was interesting uh, but yeah, the names of the house reflect the body color or the way in which your body is splitting open like a cold. So that's the cold house. And here, I want to share this. If any of you have been to the Three Jewels, um, you've seen this piece of art. I think it's still in our cafe. It's made by one of our Sangha members named Ori. Uh, he's really talented. And this is you know, my teacher, he was like, you, make sure you show them this image because it's apparently one of the most accurate descriptions or depictions of the hells. Like if you look at other Wheel of Life images, you won't see it in such detail. But here you can actually see the eight hot hells on the left and the eight cold hells on the right stacked up on top of each other. You know, like you can see that sort of elevator style um, hell realm. So you can see them there. Eight hot, eight cold. <clears throat> yeah? Okay, just a little bit more and then we're gonna get to where all this comes from. Uh, so a couple more hells here. Basically, around the hot hells, there are like four little trap doors that lead into adjacent hells, which are supposedly not as bad. So the idea is if you could accumulate even a little bit of good karma, you could escape at least temporarily from the hot hells into one of the four adjacent hells. Um, I'll go through these quickly. Again, the, na the names sort of describe it, but these are a shift in your karma, right? That's what would bring about this experience. Number one, embers. It's like a trench filled with burning embers that you're trying to cross. Um, each time you step your foot down, it burns away. Each time you step it up, it regenerates. So it, it's still hellish, but perhaps not as bad. Number two, corpse rot. It's like a swamp of corpses and other beings that like eat at you and claw at you. There's excrement. It's like a swamp of corpses. Mm, then there's Razor Road. This is this was hard to read. It was like, you're running across this surface made of daggers, essentially. And you see some trees in the distance and you find yourself chased by wild animals. So again, that, that need in your mind to, to run away, right? To get away from the pain propels you towards that tree. And you find that the bark itself is made of daggers but you have nowhere to go. So you start climbing up this like daggery bark to the top of the tree. And once you get there, this crow appears with an iron beak that starts plucking out your eyeballs. So you're like, okay, I need to come back down the tree. And as you come down, you find that the daggers have reversed direction. So they're even stabbing you on your way down. Um, and the last one, Uncrossable River, there wasn't too much detail, so I'll spare you what that is, but I'd assume it, it, it's also torturous. So those are the four adjacent hells. And then the last type of hell that the Abhidharma talks about is a partial hell. This one is, so the way it's described, it's a very particular ripening of your personal karma, which all the hell realms are. So what this is, it's saying, okay, Hector, when, when he taught this, um, gave the example of the Malaysia air flight. I don't know if we've ever like determined what happened to it. Do you all know what I'm talking about? A few years ago where it just like disappeared over somewhere near Australia, I believe, but they don't know what happened to the flight. They can never find the remains uh, and just like disappeared kind of thing. And so he was talking about like, imagine what the final moments there 
on that vehicle might have felt like. like maybe it was submerged underwater, or maybe it went up in flames. But the shared experience, the shared karma of the few people, right, on that flight and what they went through would have been like a partial hell. So that, that's kind of the analogy he gave for that. <clears throat> okay. So whatever feeling that filled you with, a couple things, I think it's really interesting. I hope you all were able to sort of watch your mind, sit with your mind as you heard those descriptions. Um, the foundational motivation for doing Buddhist practice is an understanding of this. So what I mean by that is uh, there's no motivation for doing, for meditating, for example, just to get more calm or to be more focused. Uh, like the foundational meditate, the foundational motivation for Buddhist practice is not wanting to be reborn in one of the lower realms, namely the hell realms. So it's absolutely motivated by whatever fear or disgust came up in you upon reading these descriptions. It's very much meant to be uh, a motivating thing. Like, look how good you had it, you have it now. Um, and I'll let you sit with that as I get my laptop charger because my battery karma is about to run out. Here I am. So that's one thing. But then where I want to end class is talking about why it's possible for this to be real, like a, that it's not a hypothetical um, description of how. So let's go there. Okay, so yeah, I guess you'll ask this question, like how do you get to hell? Like maybe you've said go to hell to someone or, or wished that upon someone. And so now we get to ask ourselves like, hey, like how do you actually get there? Where, is, where are these realms? Are they really under the ground somewhere? Is there really some door that leads to them? And what I'll ask you to consider is that they, these hell realms, just like the experience you're having right now, is they're simply projections. They're simply projections from your own mind onto an otherwise empty existence. It's like, I don't know, I've been, I've been doing art recently, but like, it's an, it's an empty coloring book and you're filling in the lines with your karma, with the baggage of everything you've ever done, every way, everything you've ever said, and every thought you've ever had. That's how hell is created. It's the same way that human realm is created. It's the same way today is created and tomorrow is created. It's, it's, it's no different. So uh, the idea is that hell isn't like some door that you, you know, go to or some after some reckoning day you get, you know, sorted into the uh, line that goes to hell. I don't know the Judeo-Christian really view of it clearly. So sorry if I'm butchering that. But the idea is in this system that you're just three thoughts away from hell. And actually not even three thoughts. They say you have 64 karmas in one finger snap, like 64 karmas a second. So you're just three karmic shifts away from hell at any moment. All you have to have is number one, the perception of death. Number two, the perception of a bardo hell, that in-between time. And then three, the perception of being in hell. So you're just three perceptual shifts away from hell. Three moments of mind away. That's how far away hell is at any given time. And if you think you can't go to hell, this, everyone is, yeah, this was really stressed in this class. If you think you can't go, go to hell, ask yourself again, because remember that karma is exponential. So I feel like a lot of the world like was introduced to what exponential means through COVID-19 and all those charts about like what exponential growth looks like, but that's how karma functions. It doubles every day. 
So even a small unkind deed or ignorant deed or even moment of evil, like, I don't know, maybe I think we've all had that. I certainly have. I've definitely wished others harm. Probably my, my little sister. Oh, so like two days ago. You know, like those moments grow is what we say. They expand and it's not coming back to bite anyone other than myself. So it's absolutely possible that a tiny moment of wishing others, someone else harm could snowball into a hell realm. And Mackenzie, I see that you like seem very unhappy about that. And there is good news. Uh, there is good news. We'll go through it, I, I hope, next class. But for those of you who've studied like the five spiritual paths, they basically say once you've contemplated emptiness enough intellectually, like once you've heard the pen thing enough, or if you heard the blueberry scone thing, you know, if you heard the emptiness of you, any, any uh, intellectual presentation on emptiness, once you've truly grasped that, you actually eliminate the possibility in your mind to ever have to go to hell. So that's good news. Um, I, I don't take it as like, I don't know, for me when I heard all this, it, it isn't meant to be scary. I mean, it is meant to be scary on the days where I'm just lazy and not doing anything with these precious moments of life and just taking it for granted. Then sometimes, yeah, I just sit and contemplate the hell realms and it will like, no pun intended, light a little fire under me to go and do something. Um, but more often than not, it's gratitude that this currently is not my state of being. And if anything about it feels familiar or even graspable, right? Like we can grasp that this is possible then that means that mm, either I've been there before or I see in my world people treating each other in a way that's not that far off from this. And I've promised to be completely responsible for my world. So if I could see it, I'm participating in it. That's the logic here. I have to do something about it. So hell is just three perceptual shifts away. Who made the hells? Uh, definitely not, definitely not someone else. There wasn't a construction crew that came and added all the details, like put all the daggers on the trees or created the iron grounds, right? Just like the experience you're having right now, looking at this screen. The screen, it, it's kind of meta that you're looking at a screen right now because we talk about that a lot, right? That, uh, life is like this blank screen and you're just projecting karmas onto it. So it's funny that we're all literally looking at a screen right now, but it is, it's empty of a nature. It's a piece of glass and metal with some light and movement. And, and for all of you, it's registering as something, as faces of those who you know and love, as words that make sense. Maybe you like the color scheme of my slides, maybe you don't. I don't know, you're, you're creating some meaning off of an otherwise empty object, just projections on an empty object, and that's what hell is as well. That's what makes it real. Since karmas expand exponentially, it's absolutely feasible for just one un unkind deed to become an experience of hell. It is not some faraway place. You don't just, yeah, it's not a faraway place. It's, it's a moment away. It's three slivers of a moment away to be exact. So we're almost at time and, and there's a, I don't wanna end, I mean, I don't know how this is landing for you all. There's lots of uplifting stuff I can say as well around this and we'll get to it on Thursday, we'll pick it up. But I actually think, I mean, I know most of you and I know you can sit with this and let it do what it needs to to your mind. Um, the reason I actually, asked to teach this course was very much because I, I couldn't shake the fact that hell is right here. And for a long time, I was just blind to it because I was so stuck in my own projection, like my own life, my Supriya life and the little ups and downs within my Supriya life. Um, and this quarantine and, and everything that it's brought up for me and then what I've seen it bringing up in my world it just had me thinking like oh for a lot of people the experience of walking down the street is like hell the fear it might bring up or 
every moment they've ever known. Their family stories are tinged with it. I just couldn't shake that feeling of hell is right here. It's not that far away. Um, and it made me really inspired to uh, understand really where does hell come from quickly so I could do something about it, not just for myself, but for others as well. And we will, we'll talk next week about the same thing that creates hell, creates the destruction of hell. So we'll get to that. Um, thanks for sticking with it. I know it's not easy. Uh, let's perhaps dedicate and then we can stay on. My sister did not make blueberry scones today, so I'm all yours after class if you want to chat. Okay. So we're going to dedicate. Mm -hmm. Just allow your mind to rewind through class and if you had any moment of your heart opening or your mind opening, perhaps you can contemplate beings who don't look or sound like you but have a valid experience of reality. And perhaps it's marked by torture and pain. So just hope some goodness because even that good stuff expands exponentially. So give it some fire, send it out, and then try to hold that throughout the dedication. Sashi Pupi Jukshin Metok Chang Ram Lingshin Nang Empadi Sangye Shindu Mite Wargi Drokun Namdak Shingla Drupar Shok Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kame Atayan Gewa Di Kewok Sunam Yeshe Sok Sok Shin Sanam Yashe Mejum Dampa Kuni Topar Thanks all. Thanks especially to the new folks who joined. Um, thanks for sticking through it. And that was an intense first Dharma class at Three Jewels. So please come back. It's not all hell realms, um, but it's an important class. I really, I, I think, I hope that it changes something about the way you practice. It did for me. So anyways, here's some housekeeping. This week's, med this week's contemplation or meditation is just to review each of those eight levels. Um, I think there's a lot you can do to it to ground it with our reality right now. Like an idea I had was for each of those levels, I thought of some worldly suffering that's happening like on planet earth right now. And finding you know, some organization to donate to or something I can educate myself about a little bit more that corresponds to each of those types of suffering. It's not very hard to do because there's quite a lot we inflict on each other here. So there's that and announcements. I think you've all seen most of these things, but um, especially as we near the end of the course, if anyone wants to get involved um, and plant some non-hell seeds, perhaps, some get people free seeds and get yourself free seeds. Uh, the best way I know how to do that is through karma yoga, which is basically giving other people what you want. So many, many of the faces on here have, have done that or um, yeah, are actively doing it. And Lynn, I see your question, what sort of karma yoga activities? It's actually really a really exciting time because we're totally reimagining what Three Jewels is right now. 
um, and how we're going to, you know, reach people and continue to exist. So if you're interested, just email me with what you want to do or like to do or what skills you have. Uh, and we'll go from there. The first time I asked to do karma yoga, I was alone in a room with Steven, our executive director. And he was like, great. He didn't know me at this point. It's like, great. What do you, what, what, what makes you special? What can you do? And I totally panicked and I was like, I'm very organized. Um, and then, and then that's, you know, that here we are. Um, but no, there's lots to do. It, it, whatever your interest is, hopefully we can find a project that aligns. So you're not just, you know, doing something random, but doing something that sets your heart on fire uh, instead. I'm going to stop sharing and stop recording.